You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good evening, everyone on the East Coast of the United States. My name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East West Center and the Director of the East West Center in Washington. It gives me great pleasure today to have with us colleagues from the General Accounting Office of the United States Government for a program entitled US-China Higher Education Partnerships, US Universities in China, and Confucius Institutes in the United States. Now, as many of you who are joining us, not only, of course, on the East Coast of the United States, but throughout the region and uh, various parts of the United States, we welcome you. And you are well aware of the issues related to the massive uh, US-China, uh, what I would call an educational relationship. That includes almost some 350,000 students from China, um, uh, pre-COVID thousands of American students in, in China as well, uh, Chinese students here, a uh, huge part of the service export economy, but also institutional and organizational relationships such as campuses and uh, of US universities in China. And of course, uh, this particular feature of Confucius Institutes in the United States. And in policy and political terms, this has gotten a lot of attention recently, most uh, sort of uh, importantly in Mr. Pompeo's designation of the Confucius Institutes as a center of a foreign mission of the People's Republic of China. And that was on August 13th, followed up by some comments that the secretary made in remarks in a public interview with Mr. Lou Dobbs. So the point is that we are, as in many areas of the US-China relationship, at a very important juncture. And in this case, we're going to take up the education elements. And we, we have with us, happily, real experts, folks who have dug deep into the information, the data, and the perspectives on these issues. Uh, you will see the details of their biography and their expertise in the uh, documents that led you to this program, so I don't need to belabor the, them, but just, just to simply say that Mr. Jason uh, Baer of the uh, GAOs uh, directs the International Affairs and Trade, and he'll kick off the program, followed by Mr. Carney, who will speak to the issue of U.S. institutions and U.S. universities in China, followed by Ms. Caitlin Mitchell, who many of you as observers of East-West Center programming will know has wide-ranging expertise and spoke last time on migration from our compact relationships uh, in the Pacific Islands. So uh, we have a really terrific cast. Um, my colleague, Ms. Sarah Wong, will put links to their two reports on the two respective issues in the chat function, as well as other material that pertain to today's topic. And with that, let me welcome all of you, and most importantly, let me welcome our presenters, starting with Mr. Jason Baer. Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. Baer. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the warm introduction and the warm welcome, and we're happy to, uh, to join what has been, a, I know, a great series of events that you all have hosted over a long time. You find a, a excellent opportunities to, to talk about really timely issues, and uh, we're happy to be here to, to really talk about a couple of reports that we've done uh, on this broader higher education topic. You know, I, I should just at the beginning, for those of you who aren't aware of GAO, let you know GAO is an arm of Congress. Uh, many people call us the investigative arm of Congress, uh, but we really do research on a whole variety of topics for, uh, for members of Congress, for committees. Um, we happen to all work in the international affairs and trade team. And uh, we cover uh, everything from international trade issues uh, to kind of State Department staffing issues uh, to looking at development or, or other kinds of foreign assistance. So we really do cover a, a wide range of things. And we do our request uh, or our, our work at the request of Congress when they either send us a letter or write a mandate into the law. And so, you know, we're here to really serve their needs. And a few years ago, uh, several members of Congress uh, wanted some more information really about the nature and extent of US-China higher education relationships. And so they asked us to look at the, the two topics that we're here to talk about today. Um, we actually first ran across Confucius Institutes uh, nearly a decade ago when we were looking at US efforts to kind of get outside of um, US embassies to engage with foreign audiences. And so we looked at it uh, from that perspective. But more recently, we really have looked at 
again, as we're going to hear, U.S. universities that have established campuses in China, as well as Confucius Institutes here in the United States. And I will just say, when we were initially asked to do this, the, the context was different. The, the nature of the relationship, I would say, at that point was really expanding. We were seeing a significant growth, especially in U.S. universities setting up in China, as well as Confucius Institute. I think now we're seeing this period of contraction, and we can talk about that. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues who will walk you through the reports and the work that we've done. And I think we're all really looking forward to the question and answer period, where we can really talk about the things that are um, on the front of your minds. Um, I will just add one kind of caveat is our work is a few years old at this point. We follow the issues, but we haven't done a lot of the in-depth audit work in the last uh, few months. Uh, we're certainly following things, staying up with current events. Uh, but some of the information that we have really was from the, the focused audit work that we did uh, some period of time ago. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I'm Joe Carney. And um, as Caitlin's pulling up some slides, we have some slides to walk you through today. Um, I'll just echo Jason's thanks um, to you all for having us here today. We really appreciate the chance to talk about this work. I will say it was fascinating having worked on both of these reports fascinating to review these areas when we did it. It's clearly still relevant today. So it's always, um, you know, great interest for us to have a chance to talk about it. I'll just echo a point Jason made about the context um, that was going on when we were doing this work, particularly going back to 2015 and 16, you know, long time ago, given the dynamic nature of US-China relations right now. At that time, you were seeing double digit percentage increases in the number of uh, Chinese students coming to U.S. universities over a period of a number of years, you know, preceding that time period. Um, at that time, uh, Confucius Institutes were really proliferating around the world, and in, uh, including in the United States. And U.S. universities in China had, had recently, in the preceding years, um, set up a number of new institutions in China. And so this was drawing some increased interest at that time. And I will say one area that was of particular interest, and it it undergirded um, some of our work, particularly on the first report on universities in China, was, you know, how can U.S. universities operate in China, which has a, a well-reported record on academic freedom, freedom of speech? Can they provide the kind of freedoms of research, study, speech, assembly that one would expect at a, at a university in the United States? So that was, that was some of the context that was undergirding our review dating back um, to 2015 and carrying us through. Um, so, I'll, Caitlin, you can move on to the next slide, please. Thanks. So, um, and you know what, you can, you can keep going. That was um, one more. So this is um, two things here. We have a scan code, which if you have, if you know how to access it better than I can myself, you can uh, scan your phone to this, um, to the screen right now and download a copy of this report. We'll have another one for the second report in a little bit. And we also, um, just so you know, we had the highlights page of this um, the U.S. Universities in China report translated into Chinese. We do that sometimes, you know, when we think it's appropriate and we think there might be, you know, a wide ranging interest of, um, you know, multiple um, languages. Okay, Caitlin, thanks. You can move on. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the scope of this report. Um, I won't belabor it, but there were at the time 12 uh, institutions in China that, um, that we identified as falling into our scope. We, we were included all of them that existed at the time in our review. Um, the second bullet shows the three core questions we set out to um, address in the review. One was to understand a little bit more how they are funded, how the institutions in China are funded. We also wanted to acquire, obtain from the universities and analyze the agreements that they have to, um, they have to sign with their Chinese partner in order to establish the institutions have more about that in a little bit. And we also wanted to get a sense for the actual experiences of people who attend, or teach at, or administer these institutions. Um, and one overarching thing I, I did want to point out at the outset is that the universities were central to our review. We couldn't have done the work without them. We have no authority, audit authority over those universities. They were under no obligation to cooperate with us, but we did receive very we were very happy with the cooperation we got from the universities in terms of them talking to us on the phone, providing us with answers to a questionnaire that we administered, giving us agreements, and having us at their institutions in China. So that's something um, we did want to make, uh, make clear. 
you can move to the next slide, Kayla. So, you know, it's worth noting, I'm sure many of you know, there are many US universities that have many programs in China. In the back of our report in the appendix, we, we list them all out. There were over 200 at the time of our review. These could be, you know, a semester abroad type program or a research program. But we were focusing on something different, which are the universities um, that have paired together with a Chinese university to establish a degree granting institution in China. Not many of those exist, existed at the time at all. There were 12. There might be a couple of more um, that have come online since then. The timeline on the right hand side of this page shows the 12 that existed when we issued a report. And you can see from the number that, um, that were established in the few years before we issued the report that it was a you know, a growth area, even though there weren't all that many compared to um, Confucius Institutes, for example. And there are two things that the universities have to do as sort of prerequisites for setting these up. One is they have to partner with a Chinese university. So you can't go in as an American institution and do it by yourself. There's got to be a partner. And you have to develop an agreement with that partner. And those written agreements were something that we wanted to see because we thought they might have some clarity on how those universities were gonna be run in terms of the ability to have academic freedom or internet freedom or things of that nature that might not exist at a Chinese university. Caitlin, you can move to the next slide. So here are a few, this is just a little more background, a few images and information about the, um, the universities that we reviewed. The pictures on your right, we took them when we visited um, five of these universities in China. I think they're, they represent three or four different schools. The thing that I would emphasize about the data and the images illustrated to some degree, you can roll up the data about Chinese, number of Chinese versus non-Chinese students or faculty, but you, th these were not, um, you can't paint the universities with a broad brush. There was a lot of variety in terms of the, the student composition at the universities, in terms of the nature of the campuses themselves. There were some universities we visited that had relatively diverse um, student bodies in terms of representing a number of um, students from a number of nationalities, and some that were 100% Chinese. Similarly, the campuses we saw varied pretty widely um, in, in the handful that we visited. Some have large sprawling campuses, you know, akin to what you might see in the United States. Others were nested inside uh, you know, a space at a Chinese university. So that's just something to bear in mind. And, and we saw that variation in a lot of different ways. Next slide, please. So got two slides related to what was the first research objective of our report, which is funding. And I, I will note that in reviewing the funding of these institutions, we did not um, request or obtain you know, financial records from the universities. What we relied on was what they reported to us in, that, in the form of a questionnaire and interviews where we would try to corroborate and better understand some of the questionnaire responses. Um, so with that being said, what, our, what we found is what the university has reported to us was relatively substantial support coming in from Chinese entities and relatively limited support coming in from US entities. Um, the Chinese entities who we found were supporting these institutions were the Chinese university partner, and the local and provincial governments um, where these institutions were located. And in some instances, the support that they reported to us was quite substantial. And I'm gonna refer to my notes here to give you a couple of those examples. In one instance, what was reported to us was the institution um, was, a five, was 500 acres of land and a commitment from the Chinese provincial and local governments to spend about 240 million for the construction of the institution. In another case, the Chinese partners paid for all expenses related to the institution. And there were several other examples like that. The figure below is one um, at the bottom of the page is one that we had in our report. And with, what it shows is that the exception of one school, um, these schools were not losing money. They were either generating revenue for the institutions or had a neutral impact. Next slide, please. And then on the US side, what we saw was the support from US entities, that being US government or state governments or private entities, was pretty limited and generally indirect. Um, the figure in the middle of this page shows that five of the 12 um, universities we reviewed told us that um, they had students at their institution in China that were receiving federal financial student aid. 
So student aid was the primary, primary form of, um, of government support. It's not really support to the institution itself. It's not supporting the bricks and mortar or anything like that. It was money that was going to the students who were enrolled at the school. There was only one instance that we found where a US government agency was actually providing funds to, um, us, the, to the school itself. In this case, it was over a series of years, one uh, agency was providing money to support a library. And that was it in terms of direct financial support. Um, and one other thing I will note is the Departments of Education and the Department of State have no real formal role in, in setting up or approving these institutions in any way. Next slide, please. So moving on to the second um, thing that we reviewed in our report, and this was the agreements, uh, referenced those earlier. Um, we contacted all 12 institutions and asked if they would provide us a copy of the agreements, even though some were, um, some were not yet non-disclosure agreements or that, that sort of thing associated with them. Nine of the 12 provided us copies of the agreements. But we also wanted to review um, policy documents that might shed light on you know, some of the rules of the road at the school. So you know, faculty handbooks, student handbooks, that sort of thing. And we got uh, those from eight of the 12 schools. We got one or the other type of document from 11 of the 12 schools. So we were pretty satisfied with you know, the, 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 the vis visibility that gave us into these documents. And we found is that most of the agreements some in some way or another had some sort of protection or some language that it would indicate a protection of academic freedom. And the examples and the table on the right side of the page um, illustrate this a little bit. In some cases, the language was pretty strong. Uh, you know, the members and visitors will have unlimited freedoms of expression and inquiry, or the university will guarantee the right to pursue academic topics of interest. So again, while some had language that was of that sort of strength, some had no such language. And there were some agreements and other documents that had language that would indicate an acknowledgement of a restriction. And we've got a couple examples of that on the table as well, you know, that, that, that get at sort of treading lightly around certain topics or, or reminding um, individuals that they, you know, the Western ideals of expression are not protected in China. So there's a little bit of a mixed bag uh, in, 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 in the, the final story on our view of the agreements, I would say. So the next slide. And so the final two slides related to this report have to do with the experiences of individuals who, um, who attended these institutions in China. And we were able to speak to approximately 200 people overall uh, in terms of administrators, faculty members, students. Um, and you know, I think the upshot that I think we took away from all of this is that the institutions are very much committed to making these institutions ones where academic freedom uh, is protected, but they certainly have challenges and there certainly are some restrictions we found. And there is variance from one institution to the next. They are not all the same in terms of how uh, students may experience these sort of uh, academic and other freedoms. You know, most of the students and teachers we talked to said that they felt they could talk about, teach, study any topic they wanted to. There were several who had had the opportunity to also attend a Chinese university who were able to contrast for us how the US university in China was much more free in that regard than a Chinese university. And we did firsthand observe a couple classes. We got our hands on some, uh, some curriculum, course curriculum, and, we, and they included uh, some of the topics you, you might expect might not be freely discussed at a university in China. Uh, and the, and the, the graphic on the right is of pictures of several libraries we visited at these institutions, and they're the same they include books on the same kinds of topics that some of these schools were studying, Tiananmen Square, Taiwan, uh, Tibet, those sorts of things. Um, next slide, please. Um, but we also found and tried to catalog a number of restrictions or challenges you know, to universities in China. And I will try to go through them in, uh, not in too much detail because in the interest of time. But the first one was internet access. Uh, five, only five of the schools that we included in our review had uncensored internet access. And we were able to sort of verify this at a couple, you know, we would walk around with, people would show us laptops where they could pull up Facebook or Google sites that were at that time were, were, were banned in China uh, or censored in China. Um, but seven didn't, seven had restrictions um, to one, uh, of one form or another. And aside from the 
the issue of internet free or in, in, uh, freedom of information that presents, teachers and students talk to us at, at, in good detail and at some length about what a pain this was to trying to do their coursework. They couldn't access certain software because it was the kind of software that might not be banned in China. A teacher who might try to uh, use um, videos, illustrative videos in a class, couldn't go to YouTube, had to go to another website. At research, conducting research, those sorts of things were difficult. So another area uh, that we found as a challenge is self-censorship. And you know, you have to acknowledge how amorphous self-censorship is. It's difficult to prove. It's difficult to know why somebody's doing it. A lot of times self-censorship could be, you know, could be construed as a form of politeness. And we certainly heard of people, you know, self-censoring out of an out of a um, effort to be polite. But we also heard examples of people saying to us, look, I was advised by an administrator to not discuss certain topics, or I was advised by a teacher to not talk about politics or religion. A few teachers said to us, yeah, I advise my students to try to avoid certain subjects because it could uh, cause trouble. So there was, there was enough of that that we heard that it, it definitely struck us as a challenge, or, or you could say something that sort of dampens the uh, you know, free flow of discussion. The next one is restrictions specific to Chinese students. And, and quite plainly, what a number of people said to us is Chinese students may, rightly or wrongly, sent, uh, believe that other fellow Chinese students in the classroom are monitors who will report on what people are saying in class to the government or the Communist Party. And that has a dampening effect on people's, what people, um, you know, the degree to which people feel comfortable talking openly in class. Um, and again, in the interest of time, the last thing I will talk about on this page is university legal status. And this is a bit of an um, esoteric one, so I'll, I'll just try to uh, speak at it at a high level. There were three universities at the time of our review that were designated as having independent legal status. And it has some it has some legal ramifications, including the right to own uh, property, amongst other things. But we saw some striking differences between these three universities and the nine that did not have the status in terms of all three had uh, uncensored internet access. They all had very large campuses that have been constructed for them far apart from their Chinese partners. They had the kind of student life that you might expect at an American univer a university in the United States in terms of a lot of clubs you'd walk through the hallways and you would see flyers advertising upcoming events or speakers, that sort of thing. Whereas the other schools, not to suggest across the board, they didn't have any of these things, but they certainly didn't have them consistently. And they also had some characteristics at times that the three others never had, such as restricted internet access, such as in some cases, not allowing student groups or keeping in one case, um, a very low profile in the community or restricting visitor access to the university in an effort to maintain uh, a low profile. So that was something that jumped out to us in terms of the variance we saw at the universities. So that's it for our first report and I will stop there. And I think I will just transition over to my colleague, Caitlin, and she's gonna talk about our second report on Confucius Institutes and just again, reminding of what uh, Jason said at the outset, these, these both sprang from the same request. We did the first report and then we had a little bit of a time in between and then we did the Confucius Institute report more recently. So thanks and I'll turn it over to Caitlin. Thanks, Caitlin. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, so as Joe mentioned, this, this report on Confucius Institutes sprang out of the same um, congressional interest as the US universities in China work. Uh, as Jason mentioned, we issued this report in 2019 and in the interim, we're aware there's been continued congressional interest um, and media coverage related to Confucius Institutes, um, as well as additional closures of institutes. So just a caveat uh, that our information here is a little bit dated. Um, so Confucius Institutes, as you may know, are partnerships between Chinese entities and schools in other countries arranged and funded in part by the Chinese Language Council International, also referred to as Hanban, which is affiliated, affiliated with the Chinese Ministry of Education. Uh, according to Hanban, Confucius Institutes are intended to promote Chinese language and culture learning in foreign countries. Some research, uh, researchers, government officials, uh, and others we spoke with have raised questions about whether the institutes are sources of undue Chinese influence. <clears throat> 
Um, the first Confucius Institute in the United States was established in 2004. Back when we issued the report, there were more than 500 Confucius Institutes worldwide, 96 of which were located at US colleges and universities. As mentioned, we're aware there have been additional closures, so if we were to recreate this map today, about 18 months later, uh, it would look quite different with fewer institutes. So today I'll share some of what we learned over the course of our review about the agreements that the US schools and the Hanban signed to establish the institutes, crosswalk what those agreements said with how the centers are funded and actually operate, and share some of the benefits, uh, concerns, and suggestions that stakeholders we interviewed as part of this at work um, identified. The scope of our report included Confucius Institutes based at colleges and universities, which we refer to as schools in this report. There are also several Confucius Institutes that are based at K-12 school districts in the United States, as well as the Confucius Institutes U.S. Center, which is located in D.C. That one is not affiliated with the school. To conduct our research and our field work, we requested establishing, agreement, establishing agreements for the then 96 Confucius Institutes in the U.S. Um, as Joe mentioned with the other report, we were similarly very pleased with the cooperation we got from schools on this one. Uh, we received 90 agreements from the schools um, that we then were able to analyze to better understand what they contained. Um, schools also signed an agreement with a Chinese partner university. We reviewed some of those for context on this job, but we didn't include them in this particular analysis. Um, we also selected 10 case study schools. We traveled to eight of them and remotely interviewed officials at two of them so that we could understand how institutes actually operated in practice. So while we visited uh, a range of schools that included both public and private institutions, um, ones with small and large student populations, ones that had institutes for varying lengths of time, some more recent, some longer running, um, and also schools in different parts of the country, our sample of case study schools is not generalizable. Um, so schools signed agreements with the Hanban to establish their Confucius Institutes. Almost all of the agreements are valid for five years at a time, most with an automatic renewal period of another five years. The agreements outline institute activities, funding, and management, among other topics. For example, um, nearly all of the agreements, 84 of the 90, um, that we reviewed contained the list of the same five activities that the Confucius Institutes could implement. Um, notably, these lists of activities are similar to the list found in a sample agreement template that was posted on Hanban's English language website, which you can see a screenshot of on the slide. According to case study school officials that we interviewed, Confucius Institutes also conduct additional activities not specified in the agreements, which are things generally oriented towards Chinese language and culture learning. Um, the agreements we reviewed occasionally specified information about classes or curriculum. Uh, for example, they sometimes suggested course topics that the Confucius Institute personnel might teach or support. Um, for example, things like Chinese theater arts or Chinese language for business. 14 of the agreements that we reviewed specifically discussed curriculum. Um, for example, several of the agreements noted that Hanban acknowledges that the U.S. school and its fac faculty ultimately have the right to determine the content of the curriculum. Uh, some agreements stated that Confucius Institute courses or programs would be non-credit bearing. Um, through our analysis of Confucius Institute public websites, other school provided information, and interviews with school officials, we identified at least 20 Confucius Institutes that were offering credit bearing courses on topics like Chinese language or culture. Um, at the case study schools we reviewed, where Confucius Institute teachers taught credit bearing courses, Officials said the Institute was using the school's own curriculum as was taught, developed, or approved by U.S. school faculty. Um, Hanban is responsible for providing uh, teaching materials to the Institutes according to 85 of the 90 agreements we reviewed. Uh, this is another area where many agreements seem to borrow heavily from that agreement template. Many of these agreements state that Hanban would provide up to 3,000 books and other supplies. At case study schools we visited, we observed the Institute stored these materials, um, things like books, DVDs, cultural decorations, and art supplies um, in places like small libraries or office closets or rooms dedicated to the Institute. Um, school officials also described different ways that the Institutes use these materials, some as reference materials, um, textbooks for non-credit courses, uh, or as gifts. Um, however, as noted earlier, officials at the case study schools did tell us that the materials are not used to support credit bearing courses. Um, instead, they would use a Chinese language textbook that was developed in the United States for those. Um, 
Some officials also stated that the Chinese language textbook provided by Hanbon is not appropriate for American students learning Chinese because Chinese publishers have different ideas about how much time students can commit to language study. Um, other case study school officials noted that the U.S. textbook they use instead of the Hanbon book includes traditional Chinese language, um, which is much more complex than the simplified characters developed by the Chinese government. Most agreements also provided for a Confucius Institute director or directors. The role of the director uh, described in the agreements varied, and some didn't have a description at all. A few of the agreements noted that a Confucius Institute director would be a faculty member at the U.S. school. At all 10 case study schools we reviewed, the Confucius Institute director was a U.S. school employee, um, such as a faculty member, a staff member, or an administrator, according to the officials we interviewed. In addition, several case study schools also had a Chinese director, sometimes referred to as a deputy director or a Chinese assistant director. Um, that individual reported or was subordinate to the Confucius Institute director. Um, they also were described by U.S. school officials as a liaison between the Confucius Institute and Hanbon. They often came from or were an employee at the Chinese partner school that the institute was affiliated with. Uh, most agreements indicated that Hanbon would provide and pay salaries for Confucius Institute teachers. Um, in practice, these teachers reported to the Chinese assistant director. However, case study school officials also indicated that they were supervised by the U.S. school department's leadership the same way any faculty member at the school would be supervised. Uh, in terms of funding, Confucius Institutes at U.S. schools are primarily funded by both Hanbon and the U.S. school. Hanbon generally provided um, startup funds, annual funds, Confucius Institute teachers and covered their salaries and provided teaching materials. Uh, the U.S. School Hosting and Institute generally provided annual funds, which we found came in the form of in-kind support, things like campus space and personnel um, that would match Hanbon's contribution. We didn't identify any direct federal funding being used at Confucius Institutes. Um, according to officials at the Departments of Defense, Education, and State that we interviewed, no federal funding from these agencies was being used to support or operate Confucius Institutes at U.S. schools. Um, so moving on to some of the benefits and concerns we heard from stakeholders, um, which included school officials, researchers, and others we spoke to on this job. Um, officials we interviewed um, cited benefits such as opportunities for schools to forge international connections by establishing an institute. Um, they also could receive funding and other resources for China-related programs. For example, school officials told us that establishing a Confucius Institute could provide exchange opportunities for faculty and students and might assist with recruiting students from China. Uh, officials at several schools also indicated that establishing an institute helped them launch a partnership with a Chinese university where none had existed before. School officials also noted that Hanban provides financial resources for schools uh, to be able to organize cultural events and activities, fund research projects, and provide study abroad scholarships. Uh, at some of the schools we uh, visited, these resources had enabled them to create or develop a Chinese language program or a major, um, or to continue to offer Chinese language courses even when enrollment was low or other funding wasn't available. Uh, in terms of concerns we heard from stakeholders, um, we heard a range of perspectives on whether or not Confucius Institutes bring about undue Chinese influence on a campus. Some parties expressed concerns that hosting a Confucius Institute um, could limit activities or events that are critical of China on that campus. Um, some researchers we spoke with were concerned that a school with a Confucius Institute might self-censor um, or choose to avoid hosting events on certain topics so as to, again, as Joe mentioned, be polite or not offend Chinese partners. Um, in contrast with that, some officials at case study schools indicated that um, faculty members in the U.S. were still the ones to make the decisions about conference themes, guest speakers, or event topics. Um, they offered examples of events their institutes had sponsored that were actually critical of China, um, events on Tibet religion in China, or South China Sea territorial disputes. Um, researchers and others we spoke with also expressed concerns about the Chinese teacher selection process, whereby Hanban or the Chinese school proposed the teacher candidates to the U.S. school. Um, these parties noted that the Chinese entities could use such a process to effectively screen out candidates based on inappropriate criteria, such as political or religious affiliation. Um, the case study school officials still felt that their school generally controlled the hiring process, and that while the teachers often came from the Chinese partner university, 
or were referred by Hanban, but the U.S. school still made the final hiring selection. Uh, a range of stakeholders we spoke with during this work also made suggestions, um, including ways to improve the written agreements associated with Confucius Institutes, as well as to protect campuses against undue influence. For example, they recommended that schools uh, should remove a confidentiality section written into agreements and also make those agreements publicly available online. Um, other schools suggested that, or other, sorry, other stakeholders suggested that schools should rely less on that template agreement. Um, one stakeholder saying that poorly negotiated agreements reflect negatively on all Confucius Institutes. Uh, some suggested there should be stronger language in the agreements to make it clearer that the U.S. school has executive decision-making authority. Um, we also heard that um, where an institute is located on a school or within a school's administrative structure um, could be one way to improve or signify control over the Confucius Institute. And uh, we have examples of that on the slide of different places within uh, a university that such a program might be located. Um, and finally, another suggestion we heard was that schools should only offer non-credit courses and not offer credit courses through the Institute uh, or intentionally test the bounds of the topics that a Confucius Institute would fund or uh, would cover. Um, and so with that, um, like Joe and Jason, I'd like to thank you all for your time and uh, we look forward to uh, your questions on, on both reports. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, all three of you, but in particular, the briefers, uh, Mr. Carney and Ms. Mitchell, really interesting stuff. Uh, I, I, I take that the particular details, predict, uh, Confucius Institutes or maybe the data on students has changed a bit, but let me frame my questions in kind of a couple of initial ones as people um, begin to pour their questions into the Q&A uh, function or the chat section, and then I'll read some of those. But let me start with uh, a couple that struck me. Um, one is really the question uh, on the on the U.S. universities operating uh, in the PRC. What are the what is the motives, Mr. Carney, of U.S. universities? Yes, some financial, um, presumably having a brand in China would attract Chinese students to come to the U.S. campuses. Um, I mean, one can imagine uh, those kinds of motivations. What do you think PRC motives were in welcoming U.S. universities to have campuses? And in particular, why would they have three that were, as you described, somewhat less constrained in terms of internet access, et cetera? Um, what would be the motivations? And, and the other uh, question is, you know, we're talking about PRC today, but you know, I remember reading in some detail about the Yale National University of Singapore campus issue, which was a uh, Yale University establishing a campus in Singapore. And similar concerns expressed, you know, from a variety of people on Yale campus, faculty, students, others, so I wonder if there is um, a, a willingness of U.S. universities to agree or abide by a pledge of principles that wherever abroad they're setting up universities that, that don't have the same political systems, the same ideology as we do, that they would abide by certain baselines or not set up, as we might see recently on the vaccination issue, Companies have said they're going to abide by a pledge of certain, you know, uh, checks before they proceed. Is there anything like that? So those are my questions for you. Uh, let you think about them for a second. And then for Ms. Mitchell, you know, Confucius Institutes, as I understand them, I don't have all the numbers from your report, um, but myself in visiting some U.S. campuses where there were Confucius Institutes, that they were pretty much dwarfed by Chinese presence through other means, to put it that way. In other words, there were large bodies of Chinese students, there were Chinese graduate students, um, there were uh, relationships such as study abroad and other relationships. That My point is, Confucius Institutes were relatively modest overall presence of China at a major American university compared to 
all kinds of other things such as students. So how did that play in your uh, considerations? And is there any case in which a Confucius Institute has come under legal indictment or legal troubles for the way in which it is operated on an American campus, either through violating personnel policies, financial strictures, uh, you know, those kinds of issues that, that have in them malfeasance as opposed to other issues. So those are my two questions and maybe I'll let you think. And now I see that other questions are arriving in Q&A. So maybe you could start there and then I'll turn to the Q&A uh, section. Sure, I'll be happy to take a crack at the questions on universities in China. And then I'll let, uh, you know, Jason who also worked on that report, he can weigh okay. in if he wants to correct or uh, add to what I said. Great. You know, I'll just, I'll caveat what I say by saying that we didn't actually formally review you know, the underlying motives of the PRC. You know, we certainly did sort of catalog why, you know, what were the goals or the reasons why the universities were, were setting up some of these partnerships. And I think you hit on, hit on some of those. I think we, uh, you know, sort of anecdotally, we heard some um, folks talk to, um, you know, speak to some of those issues. Um, you know, I think some that come to mind, and I'm, I'm frankly jogging my memory a little bit, but some of them, you know, some talk that there was an, an interest in, in, there was a pedagogical um, um, distinction in some of these schools, did have some niche interest. You know, I think if, uh, uh, Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, I think there were some who said that this may help to retain certain Chinese students. You know, there were, you know, again, at that time, you know, a number of Chinese students going to the United States, this was here a comparative, um, you know, a comparable opportunity here in China to an American university. Let's set some of those up and, and maybe, you know, we'll retain some of those students who are leaving. Um, another thing I, I will say for the universities we targeted, uh, or the universities that we spoke to, was the, the prestige of some of those universities was an obvious draw, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and some of them, some uh, Ivy League schools may have turned down a similar entreaty from, from uh, you know, a Chinese partner. I know that some of the universities that we spoke to who had the independent legal status. I think you may have asked how they got that or how that designation was made. And I don't know that I can actually mm. speak to that. I think at the time of our review, there were less than 10 worldwide, you know, that includes UK institutions, in, uh, institutions from around the world in China, less than 10 that had that independent legal status. Huh. And I'm not quite sure how that happened if the university may have negotiated it or something like that. I do know that some of the, the universities we spoke to who had that, that legal status told, told us that they were adamant that they were gonna have, have certain uh, conditions apply at the institution in terms of internet freedom and other, and other, other ways of uh, academic behavior or else you know, it was a deal breaker. Uh, so I, I think I'm probably just partially answering uh, the questions you asked, but um, I, don't know. I don't know. I'll let Jason weigh in if he has anything to add to that. Mr. Baer, do you have any comments? Uh, no, I, I think you all got it right. I mean, I, overwhelmingly, I think the big incentive which you talked about was financial. Again, mm -hmm. you know, largely, um, you know, they wanted to have a draw for their own Chinese students. You know, they, they especially some of these premier institutions, uh, you know, were really interested in keeping U.S. or keeping Chinese students in China and not risking losing them coming to the U.S. or, or somewhere else in the West. And, and those are really the overriding things. So you all have already hit on it. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Mitchell, uh, maybe some couple of the questions on Confucius Institutes and then I'll turn to our Q&A section. Sure, thank you. Um, so to the, the question about the context for Confucius Institutes on, on US campuses being a, a relatively modest presence, um, I'm certainly not familiar with the, the full universe of international programs, but um, one thing that I thought was interesting in our analysis of the agreements was that we found Two thirds of the agreements, about 60 of them, um, indicated the amount of startup funds that Hanban would provide the US school to launch a Confucius Institute. Mm -hmm. And that generally ranged from 50,000 to 150,000. So in the grand scope of, of uh, international partnerships, probably not as much as some others. Um, there were also a very small handful of schools that, were, um, that established model Confucius Institutes, which received um, about 900,000 to 1.7 million specifically to build a physical space for the Institute. Wow. I see. Um, but that's sort of the, the scope of, at least in terms of funding um, mm -hmm. that we were aware of. Um, 
as a, for any um, legal issues, that's not something we really included in our scope um, or came across in our work. Um, an interesting thing I might note would be the 2019 um, fiscal year NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, did include uh, a provision that made it um, made having a Confucius Institute somewhat incompatible with uh, receiving DOD Chinese flagship uh, language program money. Um, and DOD was going to establish a process with waivers, but um, I don't believe that that ended up playing out. So I, th I think that's the only area that comes to mind um, where legal issues came into play. But I'll defer to, um, to Jason or Joe if they have anything else they'd like to add. Thank you, Caitlin. Anything further, Mr. Bear or Ms. Carney, uh, Mr. Carney on, the, on Caitlin's comment? Nothing for me. Let me just add one point, which is, Please. you know, I, I, I take your observations and your personal visits to, to some of the campuses that had or, or have Confucius Institutes as, uh, as helpful. One of the interesting things, though, that, that we kind of observed was, you know, there were differences. If you looked at the universities that had Confucius Institutes, many of them were smaller institutions, many of them kind of state funded. Mm. And so for them, Fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars means a lot more than to a large flagship university or a private university that, you know, that didn't need those resources to teach Chinese or something like that, and probably, you know, come, you know, similarly didn't have the same pull for bringing and attracting Chinese students to their campus. And so I think we did observe some differences in the nature of the schools, um, and and how that played out in terms of the the CIs. Fair enough. Very interesting. Let me now turn to the Q&A section. And as I said, since this program is live, um, being recorded and accessible on YouTube, uh, they cannot see these questions. So please forgive me. This will also uh, uh, reduce the burden on our presenters of having to watch each of these, um, uh, these, presentation, uh, these questions come up. OK, so the first one is from Michael Anderson. In doing your report, did you look at US public diplomacy programs in China and how they are operating? What restrictions do they face? Yeah, so since I, I brought that one up, I'll, um, I'll take the first stab at that one. And, and again, here, the caveat is, this is work that we did back in 2009, 2010. So um, I, I can't necessarily speak to exactly the situation now. Um, and, and the context of this was, at that time, U.S. Embassy, there was a large kind of embassy reconstruction program. You know, people were calling U.S. Embassy's Fortress America, where American diplomats were hidden behind walls. And it was really difficult to engage with um, foreign audiences and foreign publics. And so from a public diplomacy perspective, the U.S. government was trying to say, how do we get out and how do we engage with people? Because it's really hard for us to get them in from a security or counterintelligence or whatever perspective. So what, are, what platforms do we have? And so we looked at the variety of, of platforms that were out there. We did happen to go to China uh, in doing that work. Uh, we went to Beijing, and then we also happened to have gone to Wuhan, China. So uh, that was fascinating, and especially a decade later, given everything yeah. that's happened since then. And you know, I think the, the preeminent thing that we heard about in terms of challenges and restrictions to engaging with those foreign audiences, also in a, in a university context, was um, U.S. diplomats weren't just allowed to go and visit a university. They couldn't go and just talk to students. Hmm. It required a, a number of uh, approvals from various levels of, of the Chinese government in order or to make that happen. And that didn't matter whether you were a first, you know, first tour public diplomacy officer or the ambassador. You hmm. always had to be going through those things. So, you know, we think in an American context about you know, kind of freedom of movement and, and building, being able to engage and, and share ideas with other people. That was one of the big things that, that you know, again, back in 20, uh, 2010, wasn't really um, an opportunity for, for American diplomats. Fascinating. Okay, any other comments on that? Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll move along the queue because we have about 10 minutes in our scheduled time. We could probably run over a minute or two. Um, see the name here. Please forgive my pronunciation if I don't get these right. Um, Michael Chikim asks, in China, are there, is there a hard firewall separation between non-state colleges, universities, educational institutes, organizations, and the state or, communist Chinese, uh, or the communist, uh, Chinese Communist Party? If not, then the typical Chinese person would think the Confucius Institutes would view their promotion of China as non-diplomatic, especially if there are similar programs in institutes. 
basically, I think this questioner, given the follow-up on the, on the Q&A here, is from a Chinese point of view, if this, this would be seen as promoting things like, any, this person makes an analogy with the Korea, found, uh, Korea Economic Institute, uh, but it seems to me there's quite different organizations since one is offering uh, educational training and one is offering a very different kind of role in society. Maybe you had comments about how hard this separation is and how that might be perceived both in China and in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that I have a real good answer to that one. And I, you know, I, as it relates to the Confucius Institutes, you know, I, I, I'm probably answering the question in an unsatisfactory way. But you know, there were a number of people who said, you know, other um, other countries do have cultural outposts. You know, France, Germany, they have they have these outposts around the world. Um, you know, there is not the the same sort of embeddedness with a U.S. university that you see at a Confucius Institute. Um, that was one distinction we heard about them, but I, I don't, you know, we did not look at some of the other elements of the question um, that, the, that the questioner is asking. So I, I, I'm not sure if I can really speak to that much better than I Anyone else? So, Otherwise I'll move to the next one. Jim Moriarty asked, how could a school have the ability to effectively vet the teacher candidates put forth by the Chinese partner? You mentioned about the hiring of these uh, language teachers. So I wonder what that process did. It, was it a personnel process of the university of the college where the Confucius Institute was located or was there some sort of vetting process to select? I can speak a little bit to this. Um, so with the, again, just with the case study schools that we visited, um, the process was described to us as varying a little bit institute by institute, but generally um, either through Hanban or through the Chinese partner university, the school would, the U.S. school would receive a proposed set of several candidates mm. um, that they could then choose from among. Um, and sometimes they said that they, they would push back. They, they tended to describe pushing back, um, you know, maybe they viewed the type of teacher they were being offered as someone who wouldn't possess, um, you know, the requisite level of, of English language, or maybe they were more of an expert in linguistics or something. Um, and Joe, I'll ask you to correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I, I sort of remembered it being more, um, they could offer, um, they could decline a, a candidate that was offered to them and um, have some sort of interaction with Hanban in the school to find a candidate that was more acceptable. But the school officials we interviewed did acknowledge that they were choosing from among the candidates that were offered. I see. Anyone else? Yeah, I would, I would agree with everything Caitlin said. Um, you know, I don't think any university told us that they, they purported to be vetting these individuals per se, but they felt comfortable with the ability to, as Caitlin said. Uh, Let me ask, so if these, no. oh, forgive me, I, I'm so sorry. You know, to say, no, these are unsatisfactory and go to a, you know, other candidate. Okay. So sorry, I interrupted you. Um, let me ask the question, but presumably if those students, if those teachers were being hired coming from, were they coming from China or were they hired domestically? And if they were coming from China, presumably they still had to go through the U.S. embassy visa process and various screenings, yeah. you know, whatever those processes are for the, to get a visa to come and work as a teacher in the United States. So there would be some USG oversight via Homeland yeah. Security slash Yes. Customs that, and immigration went in. Yeah, that would also apply. The next question um, comes from a Quinton Wong. In your opinion, based on the research that you conducted, do you believe that Confucius Institutes during the research period you considered con conducted themselves as foreign missions as they are currently defined by the Department of State? I mean, this is part of the issue of foreign missions a designation of August 13th. And so was there any evidence brought to bear? I should have been more direct in my question about criminal and legal proceedings. Part of my issue was, were there any evidence of criminal and legal proceedings filed which involved Confucius Institute personnel during the period in which Confucius Institutes have been present in our country? So I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it and, and say, one, we weren't aware of anything like that. Um, but mm -hmm. having said that, 
um, you know, we wouldn't be aware of any kind of ongoing investigations. You know, law enforcement wouldn't have necessarily shared with shared that with us, and, and we didn't necessarily reach out to them. Um, so that's a place where we've got highly imperfect information. Um, and you know, I, I have to admit, I'm also not a, a legal scholar or or an expert on kind of definitions of foreign missions, and so we didn't opine on that topic. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would I would not want to venture um, a perspective on that one. Okay. So the next question in the queue here is, um, let me come back to this because it's a more general and it's a political question and I can tell already from the question that uh, it's one that's really not about your report information, but sort of the political context in which they're being discussed. But let me come back to that because there's some more specific ones about your report. Um, Thinking, this is an anonymous attendee, thinking about the future, can GAO analysts make any generalizations about higher education, China and the West? Will we see a re-engagement between China and the West post COVID in your opinion? This also is a little bit speculative, but I, you know, as I started out by saying, what struck us as very important about this topic, aside from the specific details of the research is in this current cl climate, we're talking about the nature of U.S.-China relations and decoupling on many fronts. China-U.S. higher education relations, financially, in terms of people, in terms of the relationship as part of the overall relationship, is a huge element of the relationship. Can we therefore see a decoupling coming uh, on this front as on other fronts, as has been speculated? How far will it go? Can it proceed, given what you've seen, are any American universities thinking, second guessing their uh, decisions to have uh, created campuses in China? And similarly, um, you know, this is still in play, but how many, how many Confucius Institutes will be left in two years, if any? I'll start and, and invite my colleagues to, to chime in and, and add additional uh, insights. And I guess my short answer is it probably depends on the overall trajectory of U.S.-China relations. I, mm -hmm. I think it is unfortunately inextricably linked. Um, with regard to specifically U.S. universities in China, you know, as, as Joe talked about in the, in the presentation, there were significant financial investments, um, some on the part of the U.S. government or on, on, on behalf of, or sorry, on U.S. universities, but more importantly, on behalf of the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. um, the donations of land and buildings and the financial contributions that they were making, you know, indicated that this, this really needs to be a long-term investment. They weren't looking to get out of this in, in, in a few years. Um, and so that, you know, that's kind of, kind of a little bit of sticking power, I would say. Um, time will tell, again, about the overall trajectory of the relationship. But I think there certainly was a commitment on both sides when we were doing the work looking at U.S. universities in China that, you know, the, the relationship needed to be managed, but they needed to really think a little longer term about this and not be subject kind of to the whims of, of you know, politics and, and how, um, how things might be affected year by year. They were really more looking decade by decade. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, Joe, or anything you want Anyone to add? Anyone else? No, oh, I don't have anything to add on the U.S. university side, nor any speculation to add, but as many attendees probably know, a number of Confucius Institutes have closed Mm -hmm. since we began our review and now I believe there were about a hundred when we started our work and there's I think under 70 right now so mm -hmm. for those who aren't aware of that many of you I'm sure are that's something that's worth noting yeah. a, lot of mm -hmm. in a couple years. Caitlin did you have any thoughts okay I, I do want to point out one thing that came up in the chat and I it's uh, incumbent upon me really to to clarify I hope I didn't uh, give a wrong impression here I specifically cited the designation of, uh, that Mr. Pompeo issued on August 13th, but just someone has pointed out to us the, a note of clarification that only the Confucius Institute U.S. Center in Washington, D.C. received the State Department's designation as a foreign mission. Not all Confucius Institutes. So I, I do want to make sure I, I clarify that because I didn't mean to in, intend to suggest that all of them were declared uh, foreign missions. Uh, only as per the uh, two paragraph announcement by Mr. Pompeo on the 13th. Uh, let me go back to the um, questions um, couple here. 
do you have plans to update the first, Douglas Hartwick asked, do you have plans to update the first report? And the context for the question is, given the year and years when you conducted the research, the nature of China's leadership has changed enormously, as has the US bilateral relationship with China. Do you think that China and the Chinese universities would be open to follow up research? Uh, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that one and, and I'll fall back on my comments at the beginning. And, and that is, you know, GAO is an arm of the legislative branch. We work for Congress. And so if there are members or, or committees uh, in Congress that have an interest in us looking at that, we're always happy to receive those expressions of interest. Uh, we don't currently have anything uh, on that front, but, uh, but if, if this panel or, or other discussions spark that interest, we're always happy to have those conversations. Anyone else, Caitlin or Joe? Okay, well, I, I do know we're at exactly 18.01 or 6.01 p.m. according to my clock here. So we are at the, the, uh, the sort of appointed hour when we need to end. But before I formally thank Mr. Carney, Ms. Mitchell, and Mr. Bear for what is a really very interesting subject and a kind of, I don't know, I was thinking was, is there ever been a precedent for such large educational relationships growing so rapidly between two uh, states, uh, certainly between the US and another foreign country, um, that are now at the stage where they are. I'm not, and COVID may be a temporal thing, but more structurally, what is the fate of this? Because we've been looking at the East-West Center as part of our Asia Matters for America initiative, the local political economy of such relationships. And while we cannot draw causal factors, um, it's quite interesting, for example, to look at state higher education budgets by each state and the relative dependence on foreign students, whether from Asia or a particular country in Asia, on as related to those state higher education budgets. And one thing we, again, correlate, not ca show causation, is that state higher education budgets, as you all know, with few exceptions, have been under pressure. I mean, and post-COVID, given the state you know, requirements at state level and local level, likely to be further pressure on state higher education budgets. But part of that was offset by the ability to attract and gain tuition revenues, uh, generate tuition revenues from foreign students globally, um, but particularly since Asia accounts for such a significant portion uh, of uh, American higher education, foreign students um, may have been offset by that. But if you have a double, if, for the lack of a more technical term, a double whammy of COVID restrictions and uh, other uh, constraints on these relationships, the pressures on state higher education budgets and therefore state employees is likely to grow in the out years as well. And again, we cannot uh, show any causation amongst these factors, but analytically one can show how these compare over time and therefore what the policy implications might be. So I think we're at a very important juncture of your work. I, for one, very much uh, hope that you will uh, get congressional support to do additional or follow-up studies looking at what might be the case, you know, as we, as we move into the next year or the following year. So, but before again, to thank you, let me just uh, do an advertisement as I always want to do. September 15th, 6 p.m., Southeast Asia and the Challenge of a Rising China, featuring Sebastian Strango, Strangio, Southeast Asia editor for The Diplomat. He's got a new book out called The Dragon's Shadow, Southeast Asia in the Chinese Century. So that uh, is on September 15th and also at 6 p.m. But on September 22nd, we have Dr. Arzan Terapur of Stanford and Ms. Nilanthi Samarnayake of the Center for Naval Analysis looking at strategic leverage in the Indian Ocean region. And then we have additional programs with GAO on September 24th looking at protecting national security at US universities while maintaining international collaboration. And we have a Korean colleague joining for that discussion because Korea has been looking at some of these same issues and so we thought we'd take a look at that. There are many other programs coming up in September and October. Uh, please go to our website or sign up for our newsletter and emails to receive updated information. But in the meantime, 
let me again return to this wonderful panel from GAO and thank you for your cooperation, for your uh, studies, and for sharing them with us so that we can be better informed and think through some of the issues that confront the US-China higher education relationship. Thank you so much and thank you all participants. Be safe, be healthy, and join us again. Good evening.